Hello, I want to welcome everyone to an exciting conversation in collaboration between Planet Word and Shared Studios. At Shared Studios, we bring together unique global perspectives for transformative conversations on a variety of topics. I'm Brandon Furter, Director of Global Community for Shared Studios, and I'll be moderating today's event. We're so excited to have you joining us for this inspirational global poetry share with incredible poets from Nigeria and Washington, DC. There are over 500 native languages spoke in Nigeria, the two primary of those being Yorubu and Igbo. In this connection to Lagos, Nigeria's most populous city, we'll be joined by poets who write and perform in a number of these languages. I encourage everyone joining to listen for the similarities and differences in each language, to explore the poetic forms at work and learn about some of Nigeria's most prolific poets and artists. We will also be hearing from a prolific DC poet. Consider how the rhythms and cadence of traditional African poetry have informed the diaspora and the embodied nature of spoken word. Today's event is part of a larger series with Planet Word called Diversities that we'll be hosting in the lead up to Planet Word's official launch next month. Diversities explores the relationship between language and the city through transformative conversations with comedians and poets and artists, journalists, educators, and activists. We're exploring questions like, how do cities shape the way we communicate? How do we communicate in a particular city? What words are unique to our city and how do others understand our cities through the language used to communicate its identity to the rest of the world? Each month, we will feature a creative avenue for words and language among cities in our portal network. These moderated conversations are a chance to dive into the similarities and differences of art forms in diverse cities around the world. This will all be in partnership and lead up to the launch of the Planet Word portal as part of the Planet Word Museum. All right, without further ado, let's get started by meeting our first Nigerian poet, Amarachi Atama. Amarachi is an award-winning chant performance poet who uses her indigenous language to enchant audiences and provoke thoughts both in Nigeria and around the world. She's widely known for her sonorous folk chants in her mother tongue and recently completed a four-month fellowship with the Royal National Theatre in London. She's received numerous awards and honors for her unique art. Please give a warm Planet Word and Shared Studios welcome to Amarachi Atama. Kuku waku miri akuraku nile nzu unda burugu sokwaya alana oi nzu kamu jina kana falite mu amagi oja ojene ndiriba iba halito nugi ana makwaku mu ebube alana ikoro olunezo miri na wakati na tangene ki bogba na hunji to so Ogu abu akaibu o, awaraku asa, osisi kosi sindi ozelu, osisi kohia. Na mugwara muna idi ebube, ni bakoro ku wabazu o, mongu na wwa mwona madu o. Kidan mirine kwa chapu mpatu, uguru na usa madu zo mirina hu, uzo akune jimiri ya kwike, osi na ibu itiriti na usa no kochi, kedu ka ihe bube nke asime, adu wana madu juka muyari huza. Nne moche westimu, na muto anti nala Kamu maraka awoti we wuno lala we kwa na miri Kamu makwaka huwa jasi we wenti Osiri mude reju kaya kuwara muwako yibwe nsube Kamu mara ihijiburu oko kwa ana hiya kwa na nkete Ike mucha taroche we tukuru Nti muwe sape kaku kwebe Aka muwe bedo na bamu, anya muwe ledo na nume moche, kagasi na muna hum, okusi ya nanu wa da puta. Ikoro, ikoro, hapare anka buwa wefe nisi. Mubanu kamu maranezi ya, ni hoki yino lana wehu, na wata kiri aga hiya huya, na wapukonu maori gono nuko tika chelu. Ikoro, olu na garezi ozi, Oli kuku na garozi, ogozi zukaru wani lozi, oko tuwebe gazi wanile, osisi na wandi obodo na ya nonso. Ikoro, anuru na ina kwike na ibu mbora guna bachi njojo uzo, mwedia kamu huke megi. Kamu lukore bubegyahu, omu ne kuko bodo si wedi. Ikoro, 
Adaram kai wa munte ne ne no boda ima na huga mikembi. I koro osi si mara kupa lani ebe ki mazuba. Igares mi koro kai la 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 mo. They won. Thank you so much. Give some some virtual snaps and, and applause for Amarachi. Um, Amarachi, <laughs> I, I just want to ask you a, a few questions about your work. I think one of the one of the fascinating things for for those of us who don't speak the language uh, is hearing the words and then seeing the words on the screen and being able to follow along. And one of the things I love and and I'm interested in hearing more about is. It, it sounds, even when I don't understand the words, like you're telling us a story, um, that you're leading yeah. us through a narrative. Um, can you talk about uh, what language you were speaking and, and kind of uh, the story that was behind the words that you were, you were communicating with us? Okay, um, so because we were talking about mission and um, diversities and heritage and culture and language, so this poem, is actually presented in Igbo language. Igbo language is the language of the Igbo people of southeastern part of Nigeria. So it's actually a story. I'm glad that you could follow it. It's a story about a slit drum. A slit drum, the talking drum, we call it ikoro. So it's, it's a kind of slit drum made with wood that in the olden days is so huge, it's not movable. There is usually a kind of um, a small a roof built over it to protect it from rain and, and shine. So it's, it's usually kept in um, maybe in the center of the village or the village square. And we have some particular persons who hit the drum. That drum is used to send messages across. So we have the smaller ones, which is called Ekwe. So but, you know, when you Google it, you'll see the Ikoro, Ikoro instrument. So it's used to send messages across. It's used to alert the people. It's used to call the whole, to summon the whole village, the whole community to come together. The voice can go as far as another village. It's so, so loud. It goes so far and it's so spiritual. And it sounds come with a certain message. So if someone dies or if, if the village is supposed to come together. So this poem is a story um, about asking where the, the sleep drum is because um, I guess modernization and colonization and the rest of it started taking it away. You see people coming to burn it um, in the name of going to church, Christianity and all that. So it's me asking the sound, what is going on? So I, have, I came and I heard about this sound and I've been asking questions. And then my grandmother told me to sit down, let her tell me a story. And then she, she tells me a story about this sleep drum how powerful it is, how, what it is used for, how amazing and how it holds a whole lot about our heritage and our culture and the messages and all that. So after hearing this from my grandmom, I was so fascinated and I want to see this drum. So it's a poem summoning the Ikoro that I am looking for you, come. I want to know what is going on in our land. There are a lot of things going on today and I heard and I was told that you know about these things and you know how this thing started. Can you just come and let me know? I want to hear from you. So that's just what the poem is about. And are there any places in Nigeria where you can, where you can still see one of these uh, Ikoru drums? Yes, there are, there are a few communities um, where you can still find them and they are still using it. There is some communities here in in my state, you could still go and find them. But a whole lot of the community, it used to be something that every community must have because it's, it's a kind of um, a, a medium for their mass communication. So, but today you don't see it in a whole lot of communities, but yes, we still have few communities that maintain theirs. And I'm, I'm interested because uh, there are over 500 languages spoken in Nigeria. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing, but please correct me if I'm wrong, that English is kind of the standard tongue. Is that correct? Yes, yes, it is. And, and so do you find that, uh, are there lots of people who are speaking their, their kind of mother tongues or is, is language dying out in, in particular areas? 
and and does your work kind of speak to the the loss of language uh, and the impacts of, of what created that loss yes uh, part of the job part of what I am doing today is a kind of trying to to sustain uh, my language especially after the the UNESCO uh, uh, announcement that my language might go into extinct in so so maybe 50 years or something like that mm. yes the, the the continuous you know um journey towards modernization and all that seems to affect our identity it seems to affect who we are because you find out that a whole lot of little kids now grow up and they don't know the language because uh, they don't have the opportunity of having parents speak the languages to them. Even though the parents might know how to speak the language, they might actually uh, prefer to speak to the, the spouse, you know, the husband and wife who speak in the language and come to their child and start speaking in English. So, and there is this, um, I don't know where the theory came from, I don't know what I would call it, but there is this craze and madness that um, if the child learn English first, the child might not be able to learn the language. So uh, people just come up with a whole lot of crazy theories why mm. they shouldn't speak to the children. And so it begins to affect the languages and um, a whole lot of languages are dying away in as much as um, a lot is being done to, you know, to sustain them right now by, by a few persons. But yes, it, it's, it's affecting the language. And we just hope that... Um, Right now, I would say, yes, there is a whole lot of awareness going on and it is improving. So I, I guess that with time, we'll keep on. For people like me, of course, we can't let it die. So we keep doing the job. And then I, I, I guess I, first, I think that it might be helpful to share with, with the audience. It, it looks like you have some traditional paint on your face. Um, I, I, could you tell us more about, uh, and, and I, I, I asked this also kind of leading into you know, one of the things that I think that uh, is so impactful about your work um, is that you, you really bring the words to life through your body. Uh, you know, so my ability as someone who doesn't speak the language to understand you are telling a story, uh, part of that comes through the tone and rhythm of your speech, but it also comes through the way that you, 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 you know, you gestured and, and, and provided that story in your body. So I, I guess I'm interested if you could start with kind of how the, the presentation of your face and the makeup is part of telling that story or telling your culture, and then talk a little bit yeah. about, you know, the way uh, your body is used to, to continue to communicate that culture to an audience. Yes. So, you know, the other time I presented, I, I had um, a kind of denza, a hostel. So this is the elephant toss. Uh, I drew, you can see it again on my... Um, uh, hand fan. So the elephant talks for us, uh, the Igbo people, is uh, a staff of authority. So it is it's usually held by the men and few um, very worthy women, strong women, powerful women, which today I count myself as, as one of them. So the elephant talks, you usually see the men, if you, if you check about the, the Igbo dress, you usually see the men you know, holding it. Because in those days, it's assumed that when the, the great men, the hunters and the rest of them kill these uh, animals, they, they tend to take something from it. So it's either the elephant tusks or the skin that they will put on their shoulders to show that they have achieved that feat. And their names are given to them, title names, you know, to, to show that indeed they are great persons. So what I do with my work is try to bring back those parts of force that we are supposed to be proud of, that, that command so much authority and that sends messages across without saying much. And so that is why whenever I, I perform, I try to, to put the paintings, and these are just little dots done by uh, Witunzu, and then our bead, which is called Aka. You know, the bead is what shows the cultural presence and um, that of the, the hands also and the head. So it's just, everything is about passing a message that this is who I am. I am telling you about me, about my culture, about my heritage. And so I think that because we, we also deal with aesthetics, I think that it's usually better to start from people seeing me without me saying a word and they're already understanding 
um, a message of where I come from or what I represent. So uh, before I even say anything, so that it can it can now blend together the outlook and the language and the chant, the chant which is an ancient art, and then blending it together to to pass this message across, so that you could feel the the vibrancy and you could feel the message, even if you do not get to understand the words I have said. Uh, and uh, you definitely get that across in, in all of uh, again in the in the presentation of your body in the in the rhythm and cadence of your words and uh thank you so much we're going to come back for a conversation and and speak with you speak with you some more but i want to make sure that we have time to hear from all of our wonderful uh poets uh and so at, at this time i want to introduce uh yusuf bolagoon uh he also goes by the stage name gemini uh he is both a page and a performance poet a storyteller, a playwright, a movie critic, and a troubadour with a rebellious divergence in his art. Uh, he's a recipient of the Horn of Afro-Classical Merit Award for Excellence in the Propagation of Arts and Culture. He is curator of an annual uh, Yoruba Oral Arts Festival, and he has grace stages across Nigeria. Please welcome to the Planet Word stage, uh, Gemini. Boba wo. Owo a ma pakuta bo ba wo kuta okuta a ma pahu owo a pakuta okuta si pawu bi kan ba pa apo won akuku mole bi kan mu duba si pa apo won apajuba bi won ala ntakun gan ba pa apo won si ma owo alasu alaran bara oloburu ede aroye so gan mu magbede loni e da ti o le pa apo gbo ohun re se won ku le pa apo wo ko parun lo oro eya to pa kiti do ya ni nko mi lo mi nu awon ara ale yin se gbonku gbonku lori oro awo awon ara ale ipo se da ti e la ohun lo ndimukiri eni mi o se ni eyan mi o se eyan a o ku ni fi wa la ro la stop ifi ohun so kon edun ni won ara asokun iso kon ohun te si waju ko ri ko sun ni won dun se eni kon o lego ki agbaye afi ni meji merin eni kon o ti e lego ki agbaye so afi leji leta o mi ran beru tin ja wa nile yi o se fi bon pa aroye gan go odu bi ba to o si nle bi se kan e pa di agogo yata yo to a di mukulumu ke me bo mo ya ki yi omo baba ni nba awa da la tan ku loni owu epo wo oro wo nile yi ase n de bi mari bo ba wo owo a ma pakuta bo ba wo okuta okuta a ma pa wo owo a pakuta okuta a pa wo te kun te je la da pe ife itura wo wa weja teni te ye la da pe ifi ani ki awo wa weja won ba ni o jo yin nu apatako ni nwa nu a ke ituro oko ran lo lu fi oko sojo ni oloko mi eni pe ni o wa ni la no ni ase ti ba si ma no ni epo gi emi go si ma no ni ituro ami atata meji lo wo re ye le ti aki bo ni le je bo ni le mu ko ye yi lojo oku iwo le ji gba le keni ti mo fi so so adro ni meji be fe ti so daru me ati ki do be nu e ta gbagba ni o fe mi ja ta fe ohun ore la ta gba igbe la so la ri wo ja ipa o bo su ti eni ba ku ni ni laarin do la la de awo ni da ku fe bu do la e fa je fa ko bo ri o si ja ko ra ma mura e je be de bo bo ba soro do ki je ta re ta soro do ki je bo ra ran go aga go soro do ki je olo lu fi awo do bo ja awo do bo be fa eni yo lo sun mo jo le awo ejan be jo yere lo ku jo me be ni bi ni la jo bo wu re ti plan kan gogo bi a usa e san bi asun o di doro ka lo san wa asola <laughs> oni kele logun alagbaja logun oni ko si ko lo la dota thank you thank you so much uh, it, it, i want to ask you a couple of things uh, first uh, i know that uh, amarachi was performing in ibu uh, is this yoruba is that correct and and it yes I, yoruba and i know that you um have won an award for kind of the preservation of the language can you talk about the importance of the language to you um and the work that you've done to preserve this language 
Well, basically, I think that our language is um, one of the most private elements in preserving our identity. So, uh, for every man to his own culture, even though uh, what is it called adaptation of other cultures to the particular culture, or just like um, what you can say. Uh, Yusuf, I'm so sorry you're, you're breaking Our language. Uh, I'm sorry, Yusuf, your your uh, your audio is breaking up. We weren't we didn't get a chance to to hear. Um, and so uh, what I want to do is we'll introduce our next poet and then we'll come back. I want to save that question because I really want to hear more about it and I really want to hear more about the work that you've done to preserve the language. Uh, the audio wasn't working and I, wa I just want to make sure that uh, our audience is able to hear all the, the work that you're doing. But we'll, we'll move to our next poet and then we'll come back and engage that question when we get to the, the larger question and answer. All right, uh, I didn't mean to, to put you up on the, uh, on the spot so quickly, Tehila, um, but uh, uh, as uh, Yusuf gets his, um, gets his audio working, uh, we will cut to you. I wanna introduce you to, to the Planet Word audience. Uh, Tehila Turex is a seasoned spoken word artist and has been a performing poet for almost six years. Uh, she has an interesting history. She has performed on several platforms, including Freshers Got Talent, where she came out as a second runner up and the much talked about reality television show, The People's Hero, where she was a finalist. Passionate about using her talent to transform lives, she is an astute believer in the transformation of lives through spoken word and other forms of art. Uh, please welcome to the Planet Word stage, Tahila. Thank you so much. Who owns the woman? The God that created her? The men who think she was solely created for them. Society that has carefully scripted the life that she must follow. Who owns the woman? The child that clings to her breast. The questions that hold her over her head. She is stuck in this custody battle. This woman who dangles through space, fights to find her place. She who fights to dig up her voice in the heap of everyone else's. The woman is not a trophy to be won or a desert land to be explored. The diamonds between her legs belong to her, so halt your excavations. What is the appropriate way to take a woman's body? When did women sign over the rights to their bodies? Who gave you rights over her body? You have blamed it on her choice of clothes. When I say no, blame it on your perforated morals. You say she consented, I say anything other than yes, yes, no. Why do your eyes undress her? Unwrap her like some candy you paid for in the store. She is not an amusement park. So every time you giggle or laugh at the size of her bum, remember that she is not an amusement park. She's not a day of chance, of hit and run. So keep your sultry glances and flirtatious stunts. <laughs> I wonder if the day will come when her competence isn't scrutinized because she is a woman. The day that her frailty will not be a plate of pie that men dig their teeth into. She has watched you walk through the corridors of her existence, break down doors of her self-esteem, of her right to choose, of her right to feel, of her right to be human. She's expected to be worshipped on the altar of patriarchy, to rip her voice right out of her throat. Buried in a box, she's expected to turn the other way, to numb the pain, dance in the rain, tie a ribbon around her hair and sit pretty. She's expected to do everything else but speak up. <laughs> it may have taken her centuries of bent backs and bleeding pants bruised faces and exhaled passion, but her jaw or her voice has leaped out of her belly. Her courage has broken free from the shackles. She says, enough, enough. The woman has solved every riddle, overcome every huddle. She has navigated the darkness. She has crossed to the melody of the raging wind, but she has chosen to sing a different song. She has broken every record. She has struck out every note. She has found her own voice. She has written her own song. She will tear Petraki lean after 
her limb. She will have the misogynist for breakfast. She will bend under if she must, but she will walk out free. Thank you. Ooh. Wow. Uh, it, there's so much to, to unpack there. Um, I, I think one of the, the aspects that I found particularly powerful is the, the, the loudness of your voice as you're speaking uh, about uh, a woman's inability to speak uh, and then finding that voice and the way that you move through the rhythm and the cadence of the language to bring us to, uh, to this, whew, this powerful moment um, at where uh, as a woman, we, we, see that we, we see the power behind what happens when a woman is allowed to have her voice, um, to find her voice and to use her voice. I wonder now, if most of your poetry is in, in English. Um, is, there, is there a particular reason for that? Or is it just the language you prefer best? Is it your, the language you speak? Uh, do you speak any of the other languages in, in Nigeria? I'm curious about your choice to use, to use English as your primary commu uh, language. Okay, yes, I speak other languages as well. Just like Amarachi, I am Igbo. So sometimes I write in Igbo, sometimes I write in Pidgin English. But most times I write in English because I feel like that's the way I best express myself. Mm. But other times I write in Igbo and, and Pidgin English as well. And can you talk about some of the themes of the, the poem that you just shared with us? Uh, you know, I think that uh, from the, the US, we, we, there's generally an appearance that, that women are able to speak and do a number of things, though I think a, a lot of folks would, would question if that uh, equality is, is actually present. Um, and so I'm wondering what the uh, what life is like for women in Nigeria and how this poem speaks to that and 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 if you see that as changing because I know in the in the poem itself it sounds like there's this this finding of a voice and and this freedom at, at the end and I'm wondering if if you feel like that's that's happening for women. Yeah, absolutely. You know, here in Africa and Nigeria, because of our culture, Nigeria is um, females are seen to be second best. You know, they don't really give us um, an opportunity to express ourselves. This poem is centered around rape and marginalization. And very recently, there was an opera on social media about rape. It seemed like rape had been on the increase here in Nigeria. And several conversations came up online where people were saying that if the woman doesn't want to be raped, she, she should be dressed in a certain way. She should not be found in certain places. But this point, in this poem, I'm saying there's no excuse for rape. There's no excuse for why a woman should be violated. In this poem, I'm saying no to rape. I'm saying shut up to the rape apologist because a woman should be able to express herself in whatever way she seems or whatever she, way she wants to. And it's really in the Igbo culture where they say women, a woman is supposed to submit to her husband. Sometime, I think a few years ago, our president came and um, said that his wife should be relinquished to the kitchen and the other room. And I, I find it very funny because women are very, very powerful. And right now we have seen women take center stage. We have seen them lend their voice to certain issues and to change the narrative. You know, certain women have broken free from the stereotype. Certain women have broken free from the box that our society has put them in. And I just, I just through this one, I'm just saying women are powerful. Women should be heard. Women must be heard. Now, when I said that she will bend under if she must, I mean every word of it because we've seen women who have gone against the norm, who have done the impossible and really stepped people in the face and dared them to do anything about it. So basically, in this point, I'm just saying, let the woman have her way. Let the woman be the power that God has created her to be. So, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, one, of our, one of our guests just wrote in the chat that uh, they feel that you're speaking for all women around the world. And I think that the power of your... Uh, of this poem comes through and, and resonates uh, on so many different levels. And I think, uh, you know, one of the things that I was uh, most pleased about in bringing together this group, and we love you, Yusuf, so, so don't, don't take this the wrong way, but I was, I, I was really pleased that we were bringing together so many powerful uh, female voices, uh, and specifically so many powerful Black female voices. Uh, I think that one thing that your poem, Tahila, uh, speaks to is that this is a global conversation uh, that the, the fight for freedom 
uh, for bodies is a, a global is a global fight. Uh, and the more voices we hear resonating all around the world, whether that be uh, in terms of the fight for equality for women uh, or for racial justice uh, around the world, um, I think you add this echo to, uh, to a song that is starting to really be sung around the globe uh, and you add a very powerful voice to it. Uh, I, you mentioned earlier, will you, is it pigeon English? Yes. Can you, can you tell me a little bit more about that for, for those of us who aren't familiar with, with what, it, what it is? Okay, pigeon English, most of people call it broken English. It's like a variation of English. So instead of saying, how are you? I can say, how you day, you know? And especially people from the Wari part of Nigeria, that is how they speak, the river right, the Niger Delta area, that is how they speak. It's like a variation of English. You know, it's not English, it's not Igbo, it's just somewhere in between, you know? Just Nigerians playing around with English and creating their own flavor of it. I, I love that because I think it speaks to the variety of language. And, and I think mm -hmm. that we have, uh, in a number of cultures, we have a tendency to privilege one way of speaking a particular language over another. Uh, I think sure. specifically in the, in the US, uh, to a shunning of uh, a black vernacular and that California is one of the only states in the U.S. that actually recognizes uh, a black vernacular, a vernacular as an official language um, in the way that uh, various groups have taken a language and made it their own and, and the beauty of that, uh, of the, the art of moving that language into ways that help express people, uh, help people express themselves um, from their individual perspective. So uh, I was uh, interested in hearing how that, how that played out in, in the Nigerian context. Um, so we will welcome you back again during our, uh, our conversation, but I wanna take us from Nigeria all the way back to DC uh, and introduce you all to Charity Blackwell. Charity is a spoken word artist, a host, an MC, and poetry specialist who has spent several years contributing to the art scene in DC and across the country, a Trinity University graduate. She received her BA and MA in communications. I'm all, I, as a communications professor myself, I'm gonna raise my hand to that. Uh, she has performed and hosted events such as the Slams Poet, uh, Poetry Out Loud, National Competition, Bus Boys and Poets, and she's been on the BBC and many, many, many more stages. Please welcome Charity to the Planet Word stage. Yay! Thank you for that intro. That was dope. All right, cool. I'm just gonna get right into it. That seems to be how everyone's doing it. Let's just jump right in. Cool. Do it. <clears throat> Coming up in this world, I did not know that I would grow to be a fuse between the crafts of soccer and poetry, but I noticed the two combined have made what you know to be yours truly, Charity Black, or crafted from soccer and poetry, soccer. See, soccer, growing up, I didn't really look like much, too manly, missing the grace of the feminine touch, tomboy with the chip tooth from being too rough, left out of sleepovers, I wasn't girly enough for soccer. I mean, soccer, outside of family, I'm conscious of team, not necessarily blood related, but we've got the same dreams. I mean, blood, sweat, and tears, when by any means, poetry. In high school, I put the pen to the page, emotions engaged, happy or rage. I did it for the grade, but in the college, shoot, I took it to the stage. And judging from the feedback, I guess my rhymes are okay. Olay, soccer in college, every moment on the field, adrenaline rush, ball and touch, every moment was a thrill, winning enough. Games was luck, but we always showed up still, learned that when to choose, you never pick a loser option of giving up, moving up to the next stage from college to profession. I coach soccer, taught poetry to kids with aggression towards society that even I can see tells them they are less than worthy or deserving than other kids. Dealt the best hand soccer was their outlet poetry, was their cry when they say, Coach B, I have something to say. I said, you better put it in your lines because I learned your every action. You should share your very passion because facts, the impact on those you touch is everlasting. Everything happens for a reason. Every outcome has a cause. For a period of time, I had to resign and put my passions on pause. On July 23rd, 2015, my mother's body lay cold, dead at the scene on September 21st, 2017. My father's body lay cold, dead at the scene. I mean, we... 
We knew they were sick, but the doctor said they'd be fine in due time, my child. Patience is the golden key, but God sent his angels home. This lonely feeling I never felt. The agony of sleepless nights, these, these cards I was never dealt. My, my conscience and my sanity, they was duking it out. Round for round, pound for pound, but never clear knockout. You should have paid more attention in CPR class. Why didn't you drive to the hospital fast? And I tried to breathe life into her. She kept moving my hands. Why wasn't I strong enough to pin her body to the land? You see, these questions kept me guessing. I kept searching for my lesson. But this quest, the distress that made me feel more than less than the people around me dealt the best hands. Why me? Why now? I felt the creep of depression. I had to dig in my roots to that girl with the chipped tooth. When the world told her no, she still shot for the goal. I had to dig past my soul, past that crust that was stone cold to that warm core poetry that grew to make me whole. I had to fight for my life. I had to write to see the light at the end of the tunnel that seemed to be nothing but endless nights. I had to gather up my team, friends and family in a huddle, writing plays, finding ways to navigate through the struggle. So I write because it's therapy. My pen is always there for me and I fight because my team is strong. They help me move my weight along or carry some for me for. There is no I in team writing fights. I see the lights my love soccer and poetry thank you so, so much to unpack there uh, and uh, this is probably the the nerdy calm professor in me um <laughs> i'm gonna before we unpack the the themes in your poem and i, I uh, i'll go quickly because i want to i don't want to ask a bunch of questions i wanted the the folks joining us feel to ask some questions and we're we're moving uh closer to time but um I'm wondering, you know, in the poem, you, you talk about moving from the page to the stage. Uh, and, and I'm wondering if you can speak to, if there's a difference that you notice in, in performing poetry as opposed to, to writing and, and what of the performance of poetry uh, provides, not just the audience, but you as the, as the, as the poet. Absolutely. Um... For, so first and foremost, uh, I've actually been unpacking this question a lot lately um, in conversations I've been having with other poets um, and other events that I've been a part of and these questions, these questions actually come up, especially during this time right now, talking about writing for self and also performing for others and the difference in, in uh, spoken word and poetry. And so uh, originally I wrote as a way just to write for me, as a, as a space for, um, I mean, as you tell in the poem, it was, it started off because of like, you know, it was a grade, did it for school. People were like, yeah, you're pretty good at it. You should stick to it, Charity. And I was like, all right, whatever. And so I was just, I, I, I continued to write, but it wasn't at that point for like school or anything. It was literally just journaling, writing. If it turned into poetry, great, but I understood the importance of how healthy it was for me to get my thoughts out on paper. So when I look at some poetry that I've um, written, some of it is just for me. And then some of it that I um, come across, I feel like are stories and, and things that I would love to share with others. and. Growing up down south, there wasn't a lot of spaces like that available. There wasn't a bus, boys, and poets. There was the bowling alley and the movie theaters and Walmart. That was it. Like that was the small town I grew up in. So when I came to DC, I was spoiled. Like there was always something to do. And when I, I remember my first time going to an open mic, I when I was in, in, in high school we were reading our poems. It wasn't like performing, it was poetry readings. And there's a difference between spoken word and poetry readings. Like, you know, some poems are just meant to be read and some poems are meant to be performed. And I was, and I remember when I went to my first um, open mic and saw the poets get up there on stage and really perform the words, not just say it, but actually put movement into it, um, put feelings into it, put emotions into it, and the way it made me feel, the way it made the audience feel, the, the interaction, the crowd, the, mm, the snapping, all of that made me feel like, wow, this is, this is bigger than just writing, it's a healing, it's a very healing space. So, um, yeah, so I, I think that that's kind of the difference. I think some po like poetry, 
is meant to be written and is meant for a person to read. And even when it's done as a reading, it's not something that, um, I've been to poetry readings, it's not something that's really performed and expressed. I think that performance poetry, spoken word, is, is uh, taking those that was written on the page and actually bringing it to life, letting people feel it, letting people see it and experience it right there in person is kind of like the differences I see in it. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it brings us kind of full circle from uh, starting with Amarachi and, and clearly the, the Amarachi also uses uh, performance as a way of communicating her poetry. And, and this is really kind of for all the poets. We have a question from the audience. Um, uh, uh, Caitlin is curious whether, the po whether you find yourselves composing the poems in your minds and then writing them down afterwards or whether writing is important to the creation process itself. Uh, so do you, do you compose in your head and then write things down or do you write in order to start to create? Mm. I, can, I can answer that first. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I have to feel, let me make sure I'm answering this right. I'm curious whether folks are composing their poems in their minds. And yes, I feel like I compose it in my mind first and then write down. I don't feel like I write. I have to be inspired. I'm not a writer that um, uh, can just kind of sit down and just come up and be like with stuff like in, a, in, in on like out the blue. Like I'm a person that I get inspired, but I'm inspired all the time. And I, I catch myself in a long running Google Doc of poem ideas, just always as I'm as I'm getting inspired, like I'll, I'll have a conversation. I'm like, I'll be in the middle talking to my friends, like, hold on, y'all, and I'm writing down the thought. And because I have to like really care about what I'm writing, it's it's hard for me to just write just to write. So that's that's my response to that answer. And, uh, Amarachi, how about you? Do you generally compose in your head or? Yeah. In for me, I don't think there is anything like writing before you know you you have to you, you you have to think it you have to sometimes you even have to perform it you have to look at how will this word sound when i say them what messages am i trying to pass and all that i think trying to bring out answer those questions in your head is what will actually lead to how the the poems sometimes you even write them and it's like no this is not what this is not how i, I pictured it in my head and then you, you, you see yourself, you know, reworking it and all that. So I think, yes, I compose first in my head and then before I even go any, anywhere close to paper. But the only thing is that you might just have a spark. You might see something or hear something or just feel something and you have a spark and then you can just quickly just jot something down. Then later on, you can now harness on that and maybe expand that theme or that message that came to you. So that's what I know I do sometimes. And, and Tahila, how about you? Do you have to have this spark of inspiration before before you can write? Yes, most times actually. Even though there are times when somebody can give me a theme and I have a deadline and I really need to force myself <laughs> to come up with things. But for me, most times poetry comes to me in bite size. It could be just one line that sticks. Sometimes it might, that line might not make sense in maybe two years. I just keep it somewhere in my notepad until it makes sense. Other times it's like the spirit of poetry just comes on me and I write at length. You know, so for me, it just depends on the frame of mind and at that time, whether I have a deadline that I just need to write or if the spirit of poetry has come on me and I really need to get something. But most times it comes to me in bite size and then I have to go back later and build on it. So yeah. And and Yusuf, how about you? Do you uh, do you need sparks of of inspiration in order to write? I think yes, definitely. Everything starts from the mind. And um, personally, for me, I think in images most times. So yeah, it has to come to the mind. I have to build on it before writing. And just like I'm actually said, most times you even have to perform. That particular draft to think it would sound well to your audience and all before presenting it to the public. So yes. And I guess I'm I'm thinking about the the connections between you know I think Charity I said as we as we finished up your uh, your performance that 
uh, there's it kind of came full circle in the in the use of the body and the performance of the poetry. Uh, and you made some some interesting comments about the difference between a poetry reading and and kind of the performance of poetry. Uh, I'm I'm curious. Um, it, you know, thinking back to Gila, to you, uh, in Amarachi, all of you really, it's, it's, there's so much performance. Do you, do you always write for it to be performed or do you write sometimes just for it to be read on the page? To Gila, we can start with you. Yeah, sometimes I write for it to just be read on the stage. But when it wants to be, well, most times actually, it's actually for performance. But on a few occasions, when I just feel like, there's so much condensed in just a few lines and I don't want to build on it, then I leave it at that. But if it's for performance, yes, because I feel like performance poetry is very different. For us, it's an opportunity for us to become the words, not just we saying the words, but us becoming the words, you know? And I feel it's a more powerful form for me. I'm, when it's stage for performance, it's different for me. It's different from when it's on the page. When it's on stage, I can communicate. And I'm also very conscious of the fact that sometimes I might not be writing my truth, I might be writing someone else's. So I, I treat it like it was that person telling their story through me. Do you understand? So I let the words have vent through me. So when you see me, it's not just the words. You're seeing my body be slave to the words, you know? So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, and just, it just speaks to the power of language. You know, we're, we're, we're together in a, in a, um, in a, a virtual poetry reading that has to, or poetry performance. Um, that that's you know in collaboration with Planet Word, which celebrates language and the idea that words can live through uh, the body. Uh, also, that you're communicating other people's stories through your body. Uh, uh, Amarachi, how about you? Uh, what's the the importance of uh, performing versus just writing for the the st uh, page? Yeah, I I think I write some I write some poems just to be to be read. But one thing about being a performer is that you get caught up performing that poem without even knowing. So uh, whenever I want to write about um, topics like love, like kindness, like, you know, something that is more subtle, that I just want to, I just want people to hear the words quietly and gently. And then I, I, I like the words to be so piercing and I make sure that every word is so, so powerful and and the language is so you know it just gets to someone i write it sometimes i just write it because i'm not good at performing love poems it's it's somehow you know so i just i just write it i have some beautiful love powerful love poems that people don't ever get to see then if i have the opportunity to present it say in a wedding or in an evening of quiet you know, a quiet evening of poetry I just sit and read. But I think that even the reading, even in the, in the calmness of the reading and the way you, you tend to bring the, out the work, it's also performance. Because that is actually how you want the message to be passed across. You don't want to rush it. You don't want to come like a warrior. You don't want to be everywhere. You just want to sit down and, and, and say the words the way they are in your paper. And you end up seeing that maybe before you finish, some people are in tears. Some people are already holding themselves. Some people are already saying, oh, I miss someone. I, I think that is also performance. So I think somehow, yeah, I write for, for, for just reading and I write, for, I write like really for performance. But most of the time, even when I want to read those things, the, the performance traits in me, you know, tends to just show. Uh, so you, you mentioned that, um, you don't like to perform poems about love. And I'm wondering uh, if there, you know, Char Charity, uh, Yusuf, uh, Tahila, are there, are there certain, we'll start with you, Charity, are there certain things that you, that you just don't perform, that those words just don't live in your body in a way that feels comfortable for you to perform? <laughs> Um, personally, about me, I try not to be very stereotyped with poetry. I try not to be. <laughs> but there are some words that you're like, why really want to do this? Especially when you're already built a fan base, especially for people like Amarachi who already have an audience who expect a particular work. But for me, I try not to put myself in a box. I try not to. And I feel like sometimes 
um, poetry gives, leaves you very vulnerable. So it leaves you to ask yourself that question. Do you really want to share this much? Do you really want to mm. let, let people see this much about you? So anytime I'm withholding poetry, it's because maybe I'm not sure I want to be this vulnerable at this stage in my life. You know? So that's it for me. Charity? Yeah, I just stick to what I I'm, I know and what I, you know, I stay in my lane. I, I know a lot of like great romantic poet writers and I just, I, I don't know, like I, I, I do feel like, um, I think someone even said this earlier, I think that poetry, when you are sharing your story, you are, you're essentially sharing a piece of yourself. And so I think being, bringing your full self and being honest in that work um, is, is essentially important. So I know that I am not a romantic person in my relationships. I'm not a romantic person. And people think, oh, you're a poet. Write me a poem. I'm like, I don't do romance poems. So, um, and, and I've tried, like I've tried, I've tried to step out the box and it just turns out roses are red, violets are blue. It's not my thing. So for me, I try to just stick to topics that, are true to me, true to myself, truth that really uh, pour out of my soul, um, and don't dabble too much into things that I'm, I'm that just not me. So yeah, I'm just I'm very straight up. What you get, what you gonna get. So yeah, my answer. <laughs> I, I think I think I think that's fair. Um, and and uh, it you know I think one of the things that I'm uh, I'm taking away, and I hope the audience takes away from today is is the connection between language and body uh, and the way that, um, and the connection between language and identity. Uh, and that we, you know, I think uh, Charity and Tahila, as you, as you answered that last question, it was uh, a lot about, you know, what, what truth can I speak and what truth can I not speak? Uh, and who, maybe there's someone who needs to speak that truth and, and I'll do my best to help them speak that truth, but I can only speak the truth that, that can live and breathe through, through my own body. And uh, I think that that's a, an, important, uh, an important thing for us to take away as we think about the power of words and the power of language, that language lives in the body, it breathes in the body, it also has the potential to hurt the body um, and to hurt people in the ways in which we use it. So uh, this was a, uh, a fantastic journey from Nigeria uh, all the way back to, to DC. Um, Yusuf, I, uh, I, it's unfortunate that your audio wasn't working and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send you a message after this. I, I really wanna be able to share with the audience uh, the importance of your language and the way that you, the way that you have used your art form to, to keep your language going. And so I wanna make sure that I can share that with our audience today. So uh, I'll do some follow up to make sure that that the folks are able to hear, um, hear your words. Uh, also, I encourage everybody to uh, look out for uh, all of our poets today in their social media and their presence uh, online. Um, there's lots of incredible videos that you can watch and continue to engage uh, the work that you've heard today. As far as our Diverse Cities uh, series, um, we'll be back in October uh, with um, uh, another uh, installment of this, uh, engaging a different form of the way that language is used by different groups uh, across cities. But I just want to give a warm, uh, through the virtual space, hug and, and love to uh, all of our, our guests today. Thank you so much for sharing your talents with us, your words with us. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, you're, that you're uh, our ability to help amplify your words and put them out into the world uh, is is healing. Charity, Charity said something earlier about, you know, poetry is healing. And I, I think that uh, I feel very healed by this and I hope our audience does as well. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you all for joining us on the other side uh, and come back and see us again in October for another installment of Diversities as we plan for the launch of the Planet Word portal and the launch of Planet Word in October. Uh, Rebecca, any final words for the audience? We look forward to seeing you next month. I think it's hip hop next month. So look for that. Yep. Awesome. Moving from, uh, the, from spoken word to, to hip hop and, and all of the poetic forms that language might take. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you. All right, thank you. Bye.